Regardless of how much money we make, how many friends we have, or how many exotic countries that we travel to, there's one thing that we all will have to face at the end of our lives. It's the great equalizer for everyone out there. Well, in today's story, I'm gonna tell you about a man who refused to accept the reality of this end and the dark consequences that came from that choice. On February 8, 1877, a boy named Karl Tanzler was born in the town of Dresden, Germany. From the time he was small, Tanzler had a very adventurous spirit, and this manifested itself in a trip to India when he was about 18 or 19 years old. He just wanted to get out there and see the world and explore. And when he was about 20 years old, he took a ship to Australia and stayed there for several years. Just when he was planning to get on another boat and return to Germany, the Great War broke out in 1914, and he was immediately imprisoned by Australian officials. They said it was for his own safety so that he wouldn't succumb to any violence from Australians, but I'm not so sure about that. He was imprisoned in this place called Trial Bay, which was a castle that was converted into a prison. It looked a lot like the prison in The Count of Monte Cristo, if you've ever seen that movie. When the war finally ended in 1918, Tanzler was released back to Holland as a part of a prisoner exchange program. Now, he had to stay in Holland for the next two years until 1920, when he was finally allowed to return to Germany and reunite with his mother, who he hadn't seen in many, many years at this point. Shortly after Tanzler Tanzler returned to Germany. He met and married a woman named Doris, and the two of them had two daughters together. One of them was named Aisha, and the other was Clarissa. When Clarissa was just 10 years old, she caught tuberculosis and she shortly died. And that very tragic, tragic event had a deep impact on Tanzler. That wound is something that he carried around with him for the rest of his life. Over the next couple years in Germany, Tanzler worked some odd jobs. For a couple years, he was a plasterer for a drywall company, and then he worked as a mortician's assistant, where he would basically prepare dead bodies for funerals. In 1926, at the urging of his mother, he opted to immigrate with his whole family, his wife and two kids at that time, to Key West, Florida, following in the footsteps of his sister. They took off on a ship from Rotterdam, and then they landed in Cuba, and from there they went to Pasco County, Florida. Very mysteriously, in 1927, without saying anything, Tanzler just abandoned his wife and his two children and moved to Key West, Florida. Now, we don't know exactly why he left them, but he did later write about these strange visions that he would have from the time he was a small boy, visions of this beautiful exotic woman with deep dark eyes and luscious brown hair, and he felt that somewhere out there this woman was waiting for him and that she was his soulmate, so he probably left his wife in an attempt to find this woman from his visions. After Tanzler moved to Key West in 1927, he was able to find work as a radiologist working at the U.S. Marine Hospital. He hadn't really any formal medical training, but this was back in a time when experience could be substituted for education. So due to his past experience at some of those odd jobs that he'd worked, he actually did really well in his role as radiologist. One day, he's in the hospital, and he's working, and someone walks into the door, and he stops what he was doing, and he can't stop staring at this person who's just walked in. This person is a beautiful young woman, and she's the spitting image of that same woman who he'd been seeing in these visions from the time he was a small boy. This woman's name was Elena de Hoyos. She was of Cuban descent. She was this beautiful girl. She was about 21 years old, but in this short period of time, she'd already experienced a really harsh life. Just a few years earlier, her husband had divorced her after she miscarried a child. Her father was a cigar maker, and although he worked really hard, the family just didn't have a ton of money. And what's worse is Elena was terribly sick with tuberculosis. That's why her family had brought her into the U.S. Marine Hospital. And even worse than that, they didn't have nearly enough money to pay for the very expensive treatments that would be required to give her a shot at recovering. Tanzler got to know Elena and the family a little bit because they were bringing her in fairly frequently, and he worked at this location. And after he learned that they didn't have the funds to be able to cover a more orthodox style of treatment, Tanzler offered to take on her treatment plan himself 
free of charge. He wasn't a trained medical doctor or anything, but in his past work experience, he had gained a decent amount of medical knowledge. The family was desperate at this point, right? Because they didn't want their daughter to die, so they really had no choice but to accept this very generous offer from Tanzler. Tanzler started Elena's treatment in earnest. The treatment options range from the regular stuff that you might expect at that time, topical ointments that he would apply to her skin. He also conducted some very bizarre and at times painful treatment methods, which really puzzled Elena's family. At this point, they were out of options, right? So they had no choice but to trust Tanzler and go along with this very unorthodox treatment plan that he began conducting. As Tanzler continued to treat Elena, his obsession with her grew to an insane level. In addition to the treatment that he offered for her, he would buy her fine clothes and wines and just anything to try to win affection from her, but his very strong feelings were not reciprocated by Elena. It really makes sense, right? Because this is a guy, he's about 50 years old at this point, he's balding, he's not very good looking, and you have a 21, 22 year old beautiful Cuban woman. Even though he was doing all these nice things for her, it's not really surprising that she didn't reciprocate these very strong feelings. So she again and again rejected Tanzler, but he didn't let this get him down. He was a very persistent fellow and he just kept trying. He kept trying with these unorthodox treatment methods, but also with his attempts to woo her. As Elena continued to deteriorate, his treatment methods got even more bizarre. He tried electroshock therapy, which had never been tried for tuberculosis and for good reason. And he also ran her through an x-ray machine because that's what he knew really well. And he thought in some weird way that maybe the x-ray waves could rejuvenate the cells inside her body and allow it to heal from the tuberculosis. None of these things did a bit of difference. And in fact, they probably did more harm than good. And she just continued to deteriorate and her family started to fear the worst. In 1931, Elena was on death's door. Both Carl and the family knew that they didn't have much time left. Carl sat the family down and he explained that he had this secret new treatment. It wasn't anything that he'd tried before, but he'd been experimenting with it in his free time and he thought that just maybe this secret treatment might be able to bring Elena back to life. He didn't really share much details about the treatment, but again, the family was out of options at this point. So they happily agreed and they gave him permission to go ahead with this new treatment method. Carl worked day and night with this new treatment and amazingly, it seemed to work. Over the next couple weeks, Elena miraculously got more energy. She was out of bed. Within two to three weeks, she was seemingly fully recovered from the tuberculosis. It was a miracle. Carl was overjoyed. He was ecstatic and he couldn't believe that it actually worked. And what was even better than that from his standpoint was Elena didn't just recover from the tuberculosis. She started to get more receptive to his love advances and very quickly she admitted that she too had very strong feelings for him and she even went so far as moving in with him shortly after this miraculous recovery that she'd experienced. Elena and Carl spent some great times together over the next couple of years, but there was one problem. Her family became more and more concerned because since she had recovered from this illness, they hadn't heard from her literally ever. They hadn't heard a single thing. The last they had seen of her was her lying in this hospital bed, just clinging to life. It got to the point where the family needed answers. So this prompted Elena's sister Camilla to pay a visit to Carl's house. So she knocked on the door, Carl answered it and happily let her inside. And she asked if she could see her sister Elena because she hadn't seen her in years at this point. And Carl happily agreed to this as well. And he said she was just resting in his bedroom. So he led her towards his bedroom. She walked down the hall. He opened the door just a crack and she walked inside and immediately let this blood curdling scream out and she ran out of the house. Now, what I've just told you is the story as it happened from Carl's perspective. But what I'm about to tell you right now is what actually happened in reality. Carl did try his very best to save Elena with these unorthodox treatment methods. He tried a range of different things, but she just continued to deteriorate. And in 1931, she sadly passed away. Now, if you remember, her family was very poor, but Carl, who had some money saved away from his years working, happily agreed to pay for her funeral arrangements. And it was this big extravagant affair, but on top of that, he also paid for this gigantic mausoleum to be constructed over top of her grave. 
that only he held a pair of keys for. Every single night he would visit Elena at this mausoleum. He would speak you. to her in a very soft I voice and he even went so far as having a telephone installed inside her grave. So in some weird way, it could be a two-way type of conversation. For two years, this routine continued every single night. And then suddenly he just stopped visiting the mausoleum. Elena's family had thought his actions toward her and this weird obsession that he'd had with her was very strange to begin with. They thought his actions in visiting this mausoleum was even stranger, but what they couldn't wrap their heads around is why he would suddenly stop this behavior with how much he appeared to love Elena. So they were pretty concerned about this, understandably. Carl still lived in Key West at this point, and Key West at that time was a very close-knit and kind of nosy community, depending on how you looked at things. Carl's neighbors reported seeing him buying things like women's clothing and weird female gifts and perfumes, stuff that you wouldn't expect a single old man to buy. I suppose he could have been buying them for himself, but that didn't really seem very likely to any of his neighbors. What was even more suspicious is a child walking by one evening peered into one of his front windows and thought he saw Tanzler dancing with this life-size mannequin in front of a fire in his living room. Seven years later, these rumors reached Elena's family. They just couldn't keep ignoring it, so that's what actually prompted Camilla to visit Carl. So she knocks on the door and she starts asking some questions. He invites her inside and walks her to his bedroom and she immediately let out this blood-curdling scream, right, and ran away because what she thought she had seen in that room was a big life-size doll that was built to resemble Elena, and that was weird enough for her to report this whole incident to the police. After the police did some investigating, they found it was something much worse. What it actually was was a mummified version of Elena's now nine-year-old body. After Elena was buried at the mausoleum, Carl claimed that he had a vision where Elena was begging him to take her out of her grave. So he opened her mausoleum with the one set of keys that he owned, dug up her grave, lifted her body out of the grave, and put it into a toy wagon that he then used to transport her back to his home. Now, Elena's body was over two years old at this point, so it had seen some serious decay, right, just with time. But if you remember, Tanzler worked as a drywall plasterer in his past life and also a mortician's assistant. So he used that knowledge to counteract the effects of aging on Elena's body. He covered her body in wax and plaster to kind of reshape it. He gouged out her rotting eyeballs and replaced them with glass ones. And he did all this work in an old airplane fuselage that he'd very crudely repurposed as some type of medical laboratory. He also replaced her hair with a wig that he had fashioned from some more of Elena's actual hair that had been given to him by Elena's mother as a bit of a memento at her funeral just so he had something to remember her by. He filled her chest cavity with rags to give her body some shape and then reinforced her bones with wire just to hold this whole contraption together. Once he'd completed everything, he dressed her corpse in fine clothing that he had purchased and then he sang to her, he played her music, the two of them danced in his living room, and he even slept with her. Now, I know what you're all thinking. If he slept with this body, did he do more than just that? Well, we don't have any definitive proof that anything more happened, but when police were conducting this search and this thorough investigation of this body that he'd constructed, they did find a long tube that was inserted into her pelvic area, and it's very hard to imagine that that tube would have served but one purpose. Upon conducting this search, Carl was found to be mentally sane, and he stood trial for destroying a grave and also removing a body without authorization. By this point, remember, the crime had occurred about seven years earlier. The statute of limitations had already expired, and he was actually released. Elena's body was reburied in a new secret location so that Carl nor anyone else could tamper with this body. And Carl moved back to Pasco County where he lived a very quiet life. He bought a home out there and he eventually died in 1952 at the age of 75. That's not where this story ends. Carl's old house was bought by a Texas oil executive in the 1980s who had the entire interior of the house gutted with the plans to renovate everything. As construction workers were inside and conducting this work, they found something lodged behind Carl's old organ 
that shocked the world. It was a biography that was written by Carl himself, but a section of it was also a confession of sorts. Carl admitted that not only had he paid for Elena's body to be dug up from the new location and delivered to him, and that he spent the last couple of years of his life with her, but in 1931, when Elena was struggling and he was in charge of her treatment, he also poisoned her in order to ease her suffering. And this is what actually killed her in the end. Would she have recovered from the tuberculosis? We might never know that.